So let's start, get started. Uh, we just finished to walk up the, the hill, so we're slightly... Uh, one of my PhD students, I won't tell you which one, had a Caipirinha at lunch, so uh, if I don't uh, find the <laughs> before he enters, uh, if I'm stuck in the proof at some point, I ask him to, <laughs> to jump in and correct me. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe what I want to do today is uh, twofold. First of all, to, to show you in practice how, uh, from what we saw on Friday about uh, the fact that you have the discrete holomorphic, uh, discrete analytic functions defined uh, in the easing model or in the FK model uh, for Q equals 2. Remember, there was this relation that you had a complex valued function that was looking at, I will write it. Uh, you know, weight, you weight the probability that you go through a given edge by something according to whether you winded, how many times you winded around before arriving there. Uh, that this function f uh, satisfied something like if you were sitting at, an, at a site, it was satisfying the fact that f north plus uh, f south was equal to f east plus f west. And then I very briefly showed you uh, that this relation could be interpreted in terms of a discrete analyticity uh, property. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. Remember, I mean, it's like uh, you have the three-arm story uh, that can be interpreted in the discrete percolation that can be interpreted as a discrete analyticity uh, property, but then uh, you still have to prove something, you know, uh, concrete about something in the limit converges to something else. So the nice thing about complex analysis is that it's very, in some sense, very rigid. So if you have a, an analytic function and uh, you have certain constraints, uh, the analytic function, you know, cannot be too wild. It's all, it's an analytic function is nice. And so you are in good shape uh, in order to prove that something discrete, which is discrete analytic, converges to something continuous, which you hope is a continuously analytic because uh, things are quite uh, rigid. Uh, however, I mean, they, they requires still sort of a lot of work. And uh, in a way, you, you can even argue that the, the, the statement I showed yesterday, the, I mean, uh, Friday, that f of north plus f of south is f of east plus f of west, was already more or less around, you know, in the physics literature or, I mean, you know, people like Cardi, the type of tricks, or Ninhois, the type of tricks they knew. Uh, what they didn't know was first to recognize that this was a discrete analyticity uh, thing, uh, property, and then also to, you know, do technical thing to recognize that this was actually enough to prove convergence. And so most of the, and you will see today that many of the miracles, you know, that happened there are, lie not only in what we said well, Friday, but also in what will happen today, in the sense that it is possible to use this discrete analyticity uh, in a certain way to, to control things for the easing model. So uh, there will be one part of the lecture where I will try to show you basically uh, how to prove convergence of one given observable, which may be not the, the function f, because today we will not have time, but some related function. Uh, and, and then uh, at some point we use, I mean, what is needed, and if you look at Stas's uh, preprint, uh, you, he uses uh, Onzaga's, uh, I mean, uh, some a priori estimates that come from, you know, from complete uh, different uh, arguments. And so what I will try to show you also today is a, a short proof of the fact, of the needed fact, sort of, uh, that makes that you don't have to use Onzaga's uh, uh, computation uh, and uh, this mess in order to prove rigorously, I mean, to the theorem that Stas has proved in, in his paper. So now it, this is slightly risky because uh, uh, when I took the plane to Buenos Aires on, on Friday, I didn't know how to do it. And then when I arrived in Buenos Aires, okay, the plane was late, so there was a two-hour delay and so on. So uh, I think that in the waiting lounge in, in, at Rio Airport, I, I think I've, maybe there is a short, shortcut. So maybe it's wrong, right? So I use it also here as a, as a test, you know, to check if, if something is wrong in, in, in my argument or not. We'll see. Uh, 
of course, it's not a proof of a new result. It's just, you know, trying to find the most elementary proof for those of us who don't understand uh, or who understand on Zager, but not to the level where they can say safely this is a, a full proof uh, of that statement. Okay. So remember what we did was <coughs> we were looking at the FK model for Q equals to 2, right? And we had a domain which was separated into two pieces. Something like that. Where basically this piece was, I don't remember the notation I used, so it's a discrete approximation of a domain D with boundary points A and B. And here you have A delta, B delta, and here you have a boundary which is wired for omega, and this is wired for omega star. And you have the FK uh, probability measure, which is FP of P, which is P of P of omega, is 1 over Z, remember, times uh, 2 to the power number of connected components. and uh, p over 1 minus p times the number of open edges for omega, right? And the nice thing was that there's an interpretation of this, uh, of this quantity in terms of uh, that this could be expressed as basically 1 over z tilde square root of q to the power number of loops in some related loop model where you, you know, you, well, as I explained the other day. And the function f, we had in mind was f of a given edge z. I think I used this notation. Was basically the expected value of an indicator function that gamma goes through, uh, z, uh, z goes through gamma, e to the i pi over 2 uh, times the winding number, uh, I mean the winding of from z to b of gamma, okay? And as I told you, this weighting could, is just a difference, right? So you count the, it's basically the probability to go through z using, making an even number of turns before on it minus the probability to go through z making an odd number of turns, except that in front of Right, because there's this orientation story that an, an, a given edge z can be, you know, only traversed in one given direction because of some even odd uh, things. And also there's this idea that um, this quantity f, because of this very, uh, so for instance, if you are in a situation where you have a, an edge z like this, where you know, so I'll just recall, remind you what we did the other day. If you have an edge, uh, a point, a side z like this, where you know that the curve gamma, if it goes through, through the edge z, uh, has to come in through one of these horizontal things and go out through one of these horizontal things. And if you know by other means that, say, the edge where you go out from b has to be eastwards, then basically in this definition what you see here is that uh, this guy here, the f will be real because this will be just a difference between the probability uh, of going through f making an even number of turns minus the probability to go through, through this edge uh, times an odd number of turns, and there's no complex number here because everything is just a multiple of 2 pi. The w's are multiples of 2 pi. And for the same reason, basically here, on this edge, f is imaginary. Here, f is like uh, e to the i pi over 4 R, or maybe I'm doing something wrong, e to the minus i pi over 4 R. Uh, maybe it's a minus because I, this one has to turn minus, okay. Okay, and we had this simple relation which was that f of north so if, I, if this is north, west, and so on, plus f of south was equal to f of east plus f of west. And, um, 
and this is one already one place where the easing model you know is very nice and where the uh, because the similar statement uh, holds also for the other FK models, but what I'm going to say now is only works for easing, which is the fact that because you know that this is, say, this is a, the real number, this is an, an imaginary number, this is on e to the i pi over 4, and this is e to the minus i pi over 4 times r, that these are two orthogonal decompositions of the same complex number. Right? And therefore that you have things like, uh, for instance, the square of this plus the square of this is equal to the square of this plus the square of this because it's just the norm of this, uh, of this complex number. So, and remember we define f of z to be this complex number. So f of n plus f of sub. So in other words, you have a complex number f, f complex function defined on the sites now, right? And the interpretation of this complex uh, function on sites is to say that basically it's the sum of two, the value of f on two outcoming uh, edges of opposite direction. And as I explained to you the other day, if you define f on sites like this, this relation can be interpreted as discrete analyticity uh, property by, you know, saying if I take four points here, z1, z2, z3, z4, like this. So these are now the sites that the val this one minus this one is equal to this one minus this one times, pi, uh, times i. Right? This is something you can get out of this relation here. So the discrete derivative in that direction is equal to the discrete derivative i times the discrete derivative in the other direction. And there's one big difference with the, with the, the percolation case. If you remember the percolation case, the, our, I mean, the problem came from the fact that the discrete analyticity was not exactly an exact discrete analyticity. You know, you had the direction, you, had, you were looking at, a, you know, the derivative, say, in one direction was equal to the derivative in some other direction, like this. But you, you were rotating around one endpoint of the, of the discrete derivative. Right? So this is not exactly as, as, as nice a discrete analyticity property than when you, when you, when you, the two edges that you rotate, you know, cross in the middle and you just turn around the middle point here. So in a way, this is an approximate analyticity property and, and one thing you have to take care of in, in Smirnoff's proof of Cardi's formula was to fact that, you know, these mis small mistakes that you do by shifting in one direction and the other, you know, do not sort of uh, 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 leak out, you know, in some way that you have to can control these some of all these mi little mistakes. Here you have an exact discrete analyticity result, so in a way well, you are better off. But still, there are problems. So the so what Stas found out was that uh, there is a very natural thing to do, uh, and you'll see in a moment, given the fact that. Um, given uh, what we want to prove also is very natural. And this very natural f thing to do is to define now a function. So this is a real valued function. Careful. H on the faces of this uh, square grid. So, in a way, the, the we'll come back to that later. So, just to, to fix ideas, you know, we have this square grid which is like this, and on this grid, you know, we had this curve, you know, that had to turn all the time. Right. So, in fact, the original square grid uh, lies somewhere here, right? So. This is already the grid that you get uh, by rotating 45 degrees and then doing these uh, little wiggles around it. Now, these are guys that are called, you know, east, west, north. These are these edges. The sides here are little z. And what I define is uh, h is defined on faces. And there are two sorts of faces because of uh, even odd uh, arguments, 
you know, remember we, we use this in fact to, to say that some edges, I mean some faces of some colors have to be on the right and some faces of some other color have to be on the left because you always have to turn each, at each step, you have to turn uh, 90 degrees. So you divide this uh, set of faces into two, two, two subsets. So say the, uh, so divide uh, this set in the black ones. I just use the same notations as in the white ones, like a checkerboard uh, uh, decomposition of the square grid. And, um, and then, of course, when you're on the blackboard, it's a question, you know, when you draw something white, is it a black uh, <laughs> face or, or is it a closed or is it a, a white one? Anyway, uh, I guess in my notes I used uh, gray and, uh, okay, anyway. So, uh, so we want to define and we want that for any neighboring, two neighboring faces, so B and W, so this one being black and this one being white, we want that H of black minus H of white is equal to the imagine I mean to the squared of the value of F where E is the edge separating black and white. So we want basically to find we want to define a function, real valued function F or H such that whenever, say, this one is black, this one is white, that the difference between this one and this one is exactly the square of the, I mean, the, of the value of f, I mean, the squared norm of the value of f on this separating edge. So, of course, you may ask, well, is it possible to do this or not? And it turns out this is possible precisely because of that relation, precisely of this discrete analyticity property. So why is it possible? Of course, what you need to prove is that, uh, so first of all, you note that this is, defines only things about difference between H and two neighbors, the value of H at two neighbors. So this defines H, if it defines it, you know, up to some uh, additive constant anyway. So how do you do? You, you imagine that you know that, you know the value of H here. Well, then you know the value of h here because you just have to, you know, subtract the value of the square root of f on here. Then you, so you can go from anywhere to anywhere because you know the square root of the square of f. I mean, you know f, so you know the square of f. So you go from anywhere to anywhere, and this defines the value of h at any other place. But of course, I mean, as usual, you have to check that this procedure, you know, the definition of the value of f here, of h here, does not depend on which path you actually chose to go from here to there. And if you think just a little bit, you just need to show that some, something is divergence free or, or anyway. So the only thing that you have to prove, this is okay, only if for any uh, picture like this with four squares, so let's call this uh, B1, W1, W2, W2 in my, in my, in my domain, I have um, that when I go around the square, like this from here to here, then from here to here, then from here to here, and from here to here, that when you add up the increments, you get zero. Because in that way, basically, you, for each closed loop uh, that you can define, you end up to zero because you can decompose, decompose any closed loop into sum of loops like this. Right? So. Why is this true? Well, this is just a simple remark. So here in this picture, let's denote this guy by north, south, west, and east, these edges. Right? 
So what we want is that f, what is the increment from, I mean, if you look at the increment, we get, okay, black is larger than white, so we get f of north squared minus f of east squared plus f of s squared minus f of west squared, right? That's the increment that you would get by turning, you know, uh, well, the other way around, actually, but, right? That's what, f of north is what you lose from here to here, f of east is what you get, I mean, f of east squared is what you gain, gain from here to here, then that would you lose this, and then what you gain here. But here you recognize that this is just, you know, if you put this together and this together, you get just f of z squared minus f of z squared. Right? This is just Pythagoras' the theorem, so <laughs> you decompose f of z into just, because they are orthogonal decompositions, this is f of norm of f of z squared is just the square of uh, the norm of f of n uh, plus uh, norm of f of s squared. So here you see that there is a little miracle. Or it's not a miracle, but you have to recognize that uh, uh, it is a very natural thing to do to define uh, this function h, given the fact that we have this discrete analyticity. And of course, you can interpret this, you know, if you are a complex analyst, you might say, well, yes, of course, this is just a, some... Uh, H is basically the real part of some integral of some function. Okay, so now we have defined a function f, uh, a function h, and now it turns out that it is very convenient to try to understand the limit of h first before understanding the limit of f. So that's probably what I will do today in the first half of the lecture, is, is basically try to, or that in this lecture, I mean, in, it's not a lecture, it's an informal session, I should warn you, um, in trying to prove that basically this uh, H converges to something nice when delta goes to zero. So of course H, you know, is not uh, as nicely defined in terms of the probability of a given event weighted according to something as, as, as the function F is. Because the function f, you write, it's just a weighting, you know, this fermionic weight of, of, uh, of, the, of gamma. But here, uh, h is, is, is some discrete integral of, uh, of this norm of f squared. So. And, I mean, the, the, if you look at Stas's paper, that's the idea, that you say you first prove that you understand h, and then you try to say, well, now that uh, behind H, because we will we'll see that some discrete harmonicity, harmonicity, harmonic, harmonicity oh, okay, anyway, it's discrete harmonic, and um, uh, uh, function, so therefore it's the real value of some analytic function, and the analytic function it, in some way is uh, the discrete integral of uh, f of b squared, if, so, if you want. Okay, we, we, we will uh, come back to that later. So what can one say about H? So So you see that H is clearly not a harmonic function. Right? And because clearly its value on a black face right, is larger than the value on the neighboring white guys. So the value of H here is larger than the value on the whites. Right, so you cannot, there's no hope to have some discrete harmonicity uh, to prove that it's discrete harmonic. Uh, oh, I didn't have Kuiperinias, but uh, <laughs> somehow harmonic. Okay, I don't, I don't know how to say this word uh, anymore. So, uh, so H will not be discrete harmonic. So what, what can you do, right? But on the other hand, you see that each time here, you go from here to here, 
you lose something, uh, well, you gain something, and then you lose again, you gain something, you lose again, and so on. So there's one thing that you can do. So the first, first trick, And I mean, everything I'm going to say here, you know, they are each, each one of them are clever observations. And uh, uh, it's good, you know, that uh, Stas was <laughs> doing these things because if he wouldn't have observed all these nice little things, you know, the proof could have ended up in a total nightmare. And he just, you know, found the, the right argument, the right place to, to make things nice. So. so the first trick is restrict H to the set of, say, black faces. So in other words, so we have yet another lattice, right, which is this one. So remember, H on the black, lattice, on the black uh, faces is larger than on the white. Uh, then the lemma is that H restricted to the black faces is, OK, I don't remember if you say subharmonic, yeah, subharmonic. So in other words, the Laplacian on the black vertices of H restricted to the black, vertices, uh, black faces sorry, uh, is positive. So in other words, if I take the value here in the middle of a black face and I compare it with the mean value of H on the four neighboring black uh, faces which are on the corners here, then basically the mean value here on these four guys is larger than the value here. So why is this relation very nice? It's very nice because you, as you, I mean, you know there's a black and white uh, symmetry. We could have chosen arbitrarily to uh, decide which are the faces that we call black and which are the faces that we call white. Okay. And this would have changed h into minus h. Right, because then instead of going up here, you will go down and uh, of the same of the same value. So this will tell you. So because of symmetry, this tells you that H restricted on the white will be superharmonic. So the Laplacian restricted to the white guys of H restricted to the white guys will be negative. And I mean, you know, harmonic functions are very nice, but subharmonic and superharmonic functions are quite nice too, right? Because, you know, if you follow the value of uh, this function along your random walk, okay, it's not a martingale anymore, but it will be a super martingale or sub martingale, and provided this thing is positive or negative, it will converge, and you will have uh, the stopping theorem will not be uh, an identity, but it will be a sort of a, an inequality. And this is particularly nice because what will happen, and I'll try to explain you, is that here you have a subharmonic function, here you have a superharmonic function, but the difference between the two, so the difference between the value of h here and the value of h at the neighbor, we just saw by definition that it's f of e squared. So it is bounded by the probability that the gamma goes through here squared. Remember, the way f is defined is, is ex expected value of indicator function that gamma goes through there times some complex number of modulus 1. So therefore, the, pro the difference between the value of f here on the black and on the neighboring white guys, white guy is bounded from above by the square of the probability that gamma goes through this edge. Maybe we can prove that this goes to 0. Maybe you can prove that for a given fixed edge, the probability that the curve gamma goes through precisely that edge, that this function, that this goes to zero. 
then we are in good shape because you have one function which is subharmonic, you have one function which is superharmonic, both are very close to each other. And what we will show in a moment will be that in some sense the boundary conditions of both, you know, on the boundary of the domain, will actually be the same. And this will just, you know, force you basically that you don't have much choice, they have to converge to the same function and this limiting, and this same function has to be harmonic. And so therefore you will get that the limit of H on black is equal to the limit of H on white and that is just, so in a way, so it's going to be a, a harmonic function H where here you have A, here you have B, you let delta go to zero, get delta go to zero and you just take the function H, the simplest one you can imagine, which takes value zero here on this boundary one here. So, you know, if you take the conformal map of this guy onto a horizontal strip, as we had the, the other day, it's just the imaginary part of this thing. So we, we will come back to that uh, in a moment. So this was just to motivate uh, this first trick that it's, it's very nice to, it's already very nice to have a subharmonic function here for this function of the, of the black brackets. So how do you prove this? Okay, so I don't recommend going through the appendix uh, that Stas wrote because he proved it in many pages by just doing the, the, the plane uh, expansion. Basically, let us look at what it means, this, this uh, pro proving that it is subharmonic. Right? We want to take the value here, the sum of the values of F here, right, minus uh, four times the value in, in the middle. So maybe it's, it's better to take two times the value here plus two times the value here plus two times the value here plus two times the value here minus eight times the value here. You'll see in a moment why. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw these, uh, these little uh, lines to say that each time I draw a little uh, uh, edge like this, a little arrow like this, it means that I count the value here minus the value here. Okay. Now I claim, of course, that one way to do things you know, we try to do things in the most symmetric way I, I look at basically what is the value here minus eight times the value here. Right? So I say this is the value here minus the value here plus the value here minus the value here and so on. So here you have two outcoming edges out of each, uh, arrows out of each of uh, the corner guys and eight incoming guys in, in, in the middle and here the sum is zero. So basically what you are doing in this picture, you know, uh, eight, I mean, uh, eight times the discrete uh, Laplacian would just be, you know, here you count plus the squared of, I mean, the norm of F squared here, plus here, so you count plus here in each of these eight guys here, and here you count minus twice on each of these guys. Okay? And when I say I count plus or minus, here I just, I just mean I count uh, f of e squared each time. Right? So proving that it's subharmonic means that for each of these configurations, where this is a black guy, right, that if you basically sum the squared of the norm of f for each of the, on these, each of these edges, counted each time once with a plus, and you subtract the square of the value of the norm of f on, on these four edges here, each time counted with a minus, uh, then you get exactly eight times the discrete Laplacian, okay? So the reason I'm doing this picture is to show you this as, as symmetric as possible, uh, so, so that you see what is going on. Now, 
So we're going to decompose this picture into two four parts, of course. We want to regroup these guys. OK. Why do we regroup these guys? Because in that way, here now I have a, a side Z. Right? And I'm counting for each of these four guys, you have a contribution of the sort. So here Z is like this. Here you have plus, plus, minus, minus. So you're, each time you have a con confi uh, uh, configuration like this, where two neighboring guys are plus, depending on which corner you are of the square, and uh, two other ones are minus. And so you count, so in other words, here in that picture, you count f of north squared plus f of west squared minus f of east squared minus f of south squared. Right? That's what you are after. Now, here in this picture, imagine that this is the guy you're looking at. Remember, we said that f of z was a complex number, and that, in some sense, the value of f on each of these four uh, neighboring things was the projection of this complex, numbers, from this complex number on, on four you know, different lines. So it could be 1 e to the i pi over 4 i, or e to the 3 pi over 4, depending on. And of course, de 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 knowing which one corresponds to which one depends on, on, on uh, which corner you're looking at. So what we did before to prove that f was, uh, I mean, that h was well defined, was to use the orthogonal projection by saying, well, I take the projection on one and i, or e to, I mean, the orthogonal projection. Now the natural thing to do here, because then we will, we want to go around the square and sum the contribution to each of these four corners here. The natural thing we want to do is just to say, well, I want to keep here. Imagine that this is the top corner. I want to express everything in terms of the value of f here on these two things. Right? Because in that way, so I will get, and this is possible, right? You have a complex number f of z. You know, say, imagine you, you know its real value, and you know its projection on e to the i pi over 4. Then you know everything by just linear, you know f of z, and then you know the projection on the others also. And so therefore, it is possible to express this sum of four things by just a linear combination uh, of uh, things involving uh, what happens on these two boundaries, on, on these two edges. Okay. And then you do the same for this one, and you do the same for this one, and you do the same for this one. Of course, the reason you know is at some point you have to turn around and to use the fact that there is some uh, some symmetry. So. That's what you want to do. Now, this is just a really very simple exercise. Imagine, for instance, that here this is here this is one i e to the minus i pi over four, the direction, and here e to the i pi over four. Just to give you an example here, how how you how you do this, right? So you know that uh, f. Imagine that f of z is some real number plus i times some imaginary number, right? So the imaginary number is f of uh, west, actually, here. Now, what is, uh, then you get that f of north, or f of, uh, yeah, say, south, you know, it's just 1 over square root of 2 times r plus i. That's the value of the projection of this imaginary number on this diagonal x equal y, right? And f of so in particular, you get that i is equal to uh, square root of 2 times uh, uh, f of south minus f of east. Okay. Because f of east is the real value. Right. And in a similar way, you get that f of north is just uh, 1 over square root of 2. So I said e to the 3 pi, so probably something like i minus r. And so therefore, 
Or did I say on e to the i pi? Oh, no, I said minus here, so it's the other way around, r minus i. Right? And so you can express it again in terms of uh, f of east and f of uh, south by doing this here. Right? And so you get a simple, now when you, let, okay, let me write it just for you to see that th there's no mystery. I'm not hiding anything difficult. So this would be 1 over square root of 2 r minus square root of 2 f of south plus square root of 2 r. Right, so. Okay, so now when you expand this guy here, you just get, you know, you, you can express everything in terms of some, some function of g of r and, uh, I mean, f of east and f of south. And probably I wrote it somewhere. Actually, it's probably in my notes. Uh, I don't have them here, so. Anyway, it's not very important. And then what you end up with is that when you sum the contribution here plus the contribution here plus the contribution here plus the contribution here, you just get, you know, a quadratic, uh, something quadratic in the value of f on these four neighbors, on these four edges. And you show directly that this function is positive because it's a square. So it would have been more convincing if I wrote you what the function g is. Maybe if one of you has my course here, then uh, he, he, he may uh, tell me what it is. But anyway. OK, probably it's not very instructive now that I write you exactly the computation, but it's, it's really something uh, uh, fairly straightforward here. And not difficult. You, know, it's not, uh, you don't have to do two pages of big computation. You, anyway, it's, this is the type of thing which is nicer to do on your own than to, to you know, suffer somebody else doing it on the blackboard. But, uh. So that's, a, that's the way you see that H on the set of black uh, faces here is uh, subharmonic. Okay? Uh, and in a way, I mean, there are OK, let's put it this way. There are, there are abstract reasons for this to be true, that H on the set of black guys is subharmonic, because, because of what I just said here. You know, it's a square. It's a square uh, uh, you know, if you write this, it's clear that it's going to be a quadratic thing in the value of these, uh, these four guys here. It's a quadratic thing, and, and it's going to be invariant under you know, certain transformations. It's going to be invariant under the transformation where you add something here to one and subtract to the other on the other side or things like that. And therefore, uh, you can easily sort of work out, and that's in what he starts hints at in his paper, that this is going to be uh, because of the symmetry that it has to be always the same sign. Either it's always positive or it's always negative. But uh, as for me, I must confess, I don't have any sort of you know, deep, you know, if I should explain you know, on an intuitive level why it's true, you know, why it has to be like this, that it's subharmonic. Out of, you know, the previous thing I told you where well, f is uh, analytic and so on, say, and everything you know had the, some, some meaning. The fact that you define h in this way is also a natural thing that you can define it. But here, the fact that h restricted on one guy is subharmonic and on, on the other one is, is superharmonic is uh, not something really I, I you know, uh, you could guess before seeing it that it's true. Uh, well, at least I, I have no explanation. Maybe Stas has a, a good one. Probably he has because he, you know, otherwise you don't necessarily have the idea to look at uh, whether H restricted to one guy here is subharmonic or superharmonic. But this here is one place really that makes life, uh, you know, uh, that you can breathe on, on this, on this, uh, in this proof, because otherwise it would be really problematic, uh, technically problematic to actually uh, prove things. Okay, so properties of H is the first trick is that H restricted on the black lamp vertice face is, is subharmonic and on the white one is superharmonic. Okay, that's the first thing. Now we want to understand the boundary values. What happens to the boundary values of H? 
Is that okay? I mean, you, I think you can, I mean, you see, I, it's elementary enough so that you can work out the details if you want here. So, boundary values of H. Okay, now I have to draw my little picture again. Suppose that this is a part of a of the boundary of the domain D. So here you have, remember it was written, it was defined like this, and here you have B here somewhere here. Imagine that here you have, say, these, these are the curve gamma. You know, it, it has always to turn right, left, right, left, and so on. So it's very natural to look at the boundary of your domain, in fact, as being something like that, because uh, uh, if the curve gamma is allowed, you know, to, to do something like this here, it has always to turn here, the boundary will be, I mean, the, the bottom boundary will be formed just by black uh, faces, and the top one would be formed by uh, white ones, right, because the curve gamma has to leave, you know, uh, black on one side and, and, uh, and uh, white on the other one. So, therefore, on the bottom boundary, say, here, everything, suppose that, uh, okay, it's not a good, uh, suppose, okay, imagine that these are white ones. Right. So, you can draw sort of the boundary of your domain D as being created on one side as, things with white, and so here you have something, the, the, the curve, so maybe enters like this and will turn here like this or that, and, and then here the, it will be the other color. This will be black. Okay. Now, suppose we know the value of H here on this boundary face. What is the value on, say, a neighboring boundary face here of H? Well, from going from here to here, you, you have first to go through here and then to here. Okay. Now, of course, there's a nice observation, and very simple, which is, of course, that, you know, if you are on the boundary, I have two boundary faces here. The only way the curve gamma, you know, can go through this face here is in this direction. Um, it's through this edge here is in this direction. You know, you cannot arrive uh, by the other, in, the other, in the other direction because then otherwise you would be trapped. You know, it's this even odd story that tells you that here, this is a boundary guy, you have to go into this direction here. Because this is the inside of the domain, this is the outside. So if you, you, are, you have to stay in the inside. It's just, you know, if the curve would come here and arrive like this here, there's no way out to get to B. Okay. So it has to, when it goes through a boundary edge, then it has to go in the direction from A to B. If you but now if it arrives like here, it has to turn like here, like this. Because there's no, there's no other way. Okay. So the probability to go uh, through this edge is equal to the probability to go through this edge in that direction, okay? And furthermore, because you're on the boundary, you know, here there's no weighting. I mean, there's no complex weight. I mean, there's a complex weight, but it's always the same for all the configuration because of what I just said, you know, if it, this is a boundary edge, you cannot, you, you cannot wind around it before or going through it because otherwise you would have had to exit the domain. The domain is simply connected. So F on the boundary here is just exactly the, up to a complex number of modulus one, exactly the probability to go through this edge. So here, when I look at the value of H here, minus, uh, and I want to compare it to the value here, the difference between the two, because of the definition of H, you first have to subtract or to add the squared value of the probability 
that the curve goes through here, minus and plus, say, the square value of the function value of f, of the, which is the probability that the function goes through, through this other edge. But I've just told you that the probability to go through this edge is e equal to the probability to go to this other boundary edge. Okay. Conclusion h, you know, the value of h on all these guys here, which are these out, outside boundary edge, h is constant. h restricted, so this is the, the white, is constant on this part of the boundary. And similarly, h restricted to black is constant on this other value here. Okay? That's simple observation because of the definition that tells you that uh, H restricted to the, the faces that is of the color of the boundary that you are looking at is constant on each of the two portions of the boundary. So remember I told you H was defined up to, uh, pos I mean up to an additive constant anyway. So let's choose H to be the one, you know, H uh, to be the function that takes the value 0 here on this part of the boundary. Right? So the way we define H is we say that on, the, on one, one guy, say one on the white face on the bottom boundary, we say it's, it takes the value 0. And then we define it you know, by some path type integral up to everywhere in the middle. So. Uh, so we know h restricted to white is equal to 0 all the way on the bottom boundary. We know it's constant when you restrict it to black on the other part of the boundary. What is the value here on the other part of the boundary? That's very simple, too, because when you go, so we know here it's, the value is 0. And here you have a white face here, which is already on the other part of the boundary. And you know you arrive through a. So what is the difference between the value of h here and the value of h here? It's 1. This one is black. This one is white. So the value of h here is 1. And then it's constant all over the place on the other one. So here you say that h restricted to black is 1. Okay. So what do we have? We have two, I mean, one subharmonic, OK. I, I, Look at the, define this like this. I have h restricted to black, which is equal to 1 here, h restricted to white, which is equal to 0 here. And I know that inside here, this is positive, this one is negative in the discrete case. That's the picture. Okay. So, let me now suppose something, and that's something we're going to prove after this. Um, we probably have to make a little break. Suppose that we can prove the following, which is that for any uh, fixed R. Uh, how can I write this? Yeah. So if you remove the R, na uh, R neighborhood of these uh, two endpoints, what I want to say now is that H of I want to argue in some sense that H white and H black are close to each other. Right? I want to, to state a lemma that says H black is very close to H white. Of course, this cannot hold everywhere because here, H black is 1, here H black is 0. They are not close at all. So you have to remove you know, uh, some neighborhood of, the, of, these edge, of these boundaries in order to have say that H white and H black are close to each other. So suppose that for any fixed R like this, there exists, say, a delta r with delta r going to 0. So delta r is not a good sign. Delta epsilon r. 
such that for any edge uh, well, it's fine. sorry uh, let's put it there exists epsilon r of delta with epsilon r of delta going to zero as delta goes to zero such that for any z at distance larger than r than a and b h on the white minus h on the black is smaller than uh, epsilon r of delta for any when for any two neighboring faces near z uh, doesn't mean much near z just so everything I'm, the only thing I'm saying I remove this right I, I remove a fixed r here and now I look at the difference between h black and h white on two neighboring uh, faces that are away uh, from these uh, endpoints a and b of course epsilon r depends only also on the shape of d but that basically here these two functions are very close together they are almost the same Then what you end up here is, in a way, saying that, let, let me now explain just with, in plain words. Of course, then, here, this type of argument has two proofs. The first one is, you know, for complex analysts, you know, they give you some, something involving some contour integral or whatever and say it's trivial. And uh, for subharmonic functions, and, and we prefer, you know, to have little random walks and... <laughs> If you are doing probability theory, you prefer to express everything in terms of a simple random walk. So what this tells you, suppose that you have this lemma, right? So that means that if you remove this little r here, first of all, you know that h restricted on black on white here is 0. h restricted on black is 1 here on this boundary. So this says that if you look at the white guy that are neighboring the black ones on the top boundary, right, they will be, you know, larger than h restricted to white, larger than 1 minus epsilon. Right? Because here you have a white guy which is neighboring a black thing, and the black thing is, takes the value 1. You are a distance at least r from the boundary here, so this one, this the difference between these two is uh, at least epsilon, where epsilon r of delta, so. right? And of course, it's smaller than one because the value on the white ones is smaller than the value of the black ones. Okay. So why I'm doing that? Because I want you know to have a boundary conditions for H W altogether and a boundary condition for H B altogether. So you have to look at the white uh, faces that are near neighboring the top boundary and the black faces that are neighboring here. But here, exactly with the same argument, here you know that the black faces that are neighboring the bottom part here, except if they are in this little ball of radius r, will be uh, smaller than epsilon r. For the same reason. So when you say that, I imagine that, OK, the other thing that we can say is that anyway, because of the definition of f and of h, anyway here, h restricted to black and h restricted to white is smaller than 2 here, near the boundary here. Or you can say it's smaller than 1 also, uh, anyway. But here they are bounded. When, when they are sort of, uh, right here, the one takes the value 1, the other one takes the value 0, and the first one is larger than 0, 
but you add up some, you add to zero something which is smaller than one because it's f which is smaller than one when you jump along one edge. Okay. So h, you know, when you are on the boundary here, it remains bounded here and here. When you are next to the boundary. Okay. Because well, you, you might say maybe it's, it's you can say. Right, because here, what you know, you don't control the fact that what you lose from going from the black one uh, to the neighboring white one is goes to zero, but you know that what you lose is at least is, is anyway not more than one, because f by definition is smaller than one on, on one edge. Right, it's a weighted probability, so it's a, uh, cannot be larger than one. So now, if I take a point z here inside, so in the sense done in, in the, the sense of Z being really inside the domain. Okay. What can you say about HW right, of Z? HW of Z, uh, remember this is uh, super harmonic. Right. So that means that if you if you start a random walk here, start it from here, and you follow the evolution of H along this random walk, if you do this random walk only on the white, uh, if you restrict it on the white guys, you do a random walk on the white cells, okay? You restrict, and, and you look at the evolution of, of HW along this random walk, it's uh, sub martingale, that means it's in average it always decreasing, decreases, because the Laplacian is negative. Right? At each step, the value at each step, you know, is smaller than the average value at the next step. That's what Laplace negative means. Okay. So it's, uh, it goes down, so it's a super martingale. Okay. There's always this uh, problem why are called mart sub martingale and sub harmonic functions called, okay, anyway. So this was goes down, and then you know the value at the, when you finish. You know the value near the boundary. You know that here the value takes zero and here the value gets close to one on the other side. That's the value at the end point. So in some sense, you, you will end up with something, say like HW of Z, right? Because you lose something at each step, it will be roughly, it will be larger, roughly speaking, than uh, uh, let's put it this way, uh, that the expected value of HW on, say, the Brownian motion, or not the random walk, say, call it S, uh, T, where T is the moment when you get out. So here you have a random walk, and this is the stopping time. Now, what happens to this thing? Either you get out here, the value is zero. Either you get out here, the value is close to one. Or you get out here, and then the value is bounded uh, by one. And it's positive. Okay? So if you take r small enough, then the probability to get out here go is small. And if you take delta small enough, then the probability to get out, I mean, the, pro what you, the value you get here is very close to 1. So if you take little r small enough, and if you take delta, the mesh of the lattice small enough, what you immediately get is that hw of z is larger than, OK, uh, the discrete harmonic function that takes the value uh, 1 and 0 here on the boundary on this set of uh, white guys, minus something, uh, minus uh, eta. And this guy goes to 0, provided you take r small enough and delta small enough. Right. 
Yes? Okay, so what I say is that you have this, uh, this function, H, I, I just look at HW. What I say is that HW uh, is, the Laplacian of HW is negative. So the average value on the four neighbors is smaller than the average value in the middle. So that means that if at step, at the given step you are in the middle, the average value of the value of H at the next step for a random walk is smaller than the value at which you are. Right? So that's exactly meaning that uh, HW of SN, it's a super martingale, you know, its average value decreases. At each step you lose something. The expected value at the next step is smaller than the value at the step at which you are. Well, it could come back, but, but uh, uh, it's an average, right? It has a certain probability to come back, but it's, it's compensated by the fact that you have a certain probability to go uh, elsewhere where the value of H is bad. Okay. And so you apply the stopping theorem. So at the stopping time T, at the end, you, are at the, you start better off than the mean value that you have at the end. And I claim that if delta, if r is small and delta is small, then this expected value at the end is basically very close to, as close as you want to the harmonic function that takes the value 1 here and 0 here on this grid. So the same is true for h black. So what you get is that h black in a similar way will be smaller than, you know, uh, the discrete harmonic function on the black vertices plus some uh, eta prime. That's it. Okay. And now you're okay. Now it's finished because when you let delta go to zero, either you invoke some, you know, uh, general statement about discrete green function converging to continuous green functions or discrete harmonic functions converging to continuous harmonic function, or you just say that simple random walk converges to brown in motion whether you look at it on the black vertice or the white ones when the mesh of the lattice go to zero. And you know that this guy, this discrete harmonic function here, and this, this discrete harmonic function here, they both, when delta go to zero, they both converge to the same thing. They both converge to the function h, that is harmonic here, takes the value 1 here, and takes the value 0 here. It's just the probability to, that the random walk gets out on the top uh, of the domain. So you are not quite done, but actually, yes, you are done. Because on the other hand, so you know that this one is larger than this minus eta. Eta can be taken as small as you want, so what you get is that the limit value of HW, or the lim inf value of HW, is larger than this function little h. The lim, inf, the lim sup value of HB is smaller than this function h. Right? But HB is larger than HW. Therefore, they converge to the same guy, which is h. So conclusion, so we, and we know HB minus HW goes to zero inside the domain. That's the lemma. So therefore, HB and HW converge to H. And this convergence takes place uniformly in any compact subset of the domain D that you look at. Okay. So here you see this is nice because here we have one, okay, slightly complicated functional that you define out of the easy model. You know, this discrete integral of F, modulus of F squared, if you want. 
And when delta goes to zero, this guy converges, and it converges to a nice function, which is the solution to, you know, this uh, simplest uh, equation you could imagine. The nice thing about this equation, of course, is that it's conformally invariant. You know, if I took this in another domain, because of conformal invariance of Brownian motion, that's a pretentious way to look at it, uh, you know, the solution of this guy in one domain and the solution of this guy in another domain, they are mapped on one to another if the domains are conformally equivalent. So this tells you that here you have a guy in the limit which is conformally invariant. Okay. Now, in a way, you, you might say that Understanding this limit of H is enough in order to do what you need then about SLE and so on, because it's already something that is, okay, I don't want to go into too many details there, but, uh, okay. What, what Stas then does in, 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 in his paper, I'm not sure I will do this and in, in, uh, tell you that. If you're interested, you can just look at how, how he proceeds. Is, okay, you have first have the convergence of H to this harmonic function. And then you want to deduce from, deduce from it the convergence of f to what you want. So again, you have to, and this is non-trivial, non highly non-trivial. The, the, thing, the thing that you, you need uh, is to use the fact again in that proof that h, you know, is h restricted on black vertices is subharmonic and the other one is superharmonic. If, if you look in the proof at some point, you know, you use the fact that you can replace uh, some absolute value of Laplacian by the Laplacian itself. So when you restrict on the black or white vertices. And there is still some work to do, you know, to, but of the same type of arguments than the one I described to you here. Uh, okay, uh, we, we will, uh, uh, maybe I'll discuss that later. So I guess we do a little break. And after the break, so let's, let's take uh, 10 minutes. And after the break, uh, I'll prove this. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so they both converge to the same. Uh, yeah, okay, that's enough. I agree. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, no, no, that's enough. You could just say HP. It's, it's, it's just that they are, one is larger than the other in the sense, in some sense, which is by taking the neighbors, so they're not exactly defined on the, but, okay, this, you're right, you don't need it. So in some sense here, you just use it uh, if you, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems you just use it near the boundary here. The fact that HB minus HW go to zero. Okay, so after the break, uh, I try to give you a justification of this, because if you look at Stas's paper, the way he's, okay, I'm going to, he, he says this is a consequence of Onsaga's estimate. And uh, the probability basically that if you are away from A and B, the probability that gamma goes through there, that this is smaller than, that this goes to zero when delta goes to zero. And I'll try to produce another proof. We'll see what, what happens. Okay, so 10 minute break. <laughs>